Okay, so let's start. Um, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Nicolas Ferry, I'm a technical architect at Ubisoft Montreal. It's an honor to be with you today. Um, two years ago, I made a talk at CppCon, and it was about how we use C++ and the big AAA games that we make at Ubisoft Montreal. Uh, but today, I want to talk about the game I've been working on for four years now, which is uh, Rainbow Six Siege. So what is Rainbow Six Siege? It's a tactical first-person shooter, and the main mode in Rainbow Six Siege is really 5 versus 5, and it's running at 60 FPS, so 60 frames per second. So less than 17 milliseconds per frame, so you can imagine how precious every millisecond is. Uh, the game is built around the concept of the siege, which is offense versus defense, and procedural destruction is a core gameplay mechanism. So basically, in siege, when you breach inside a room, you don't only go through um, a door or window, but also through a wall or through a ceiling. And I can, can say that the game is actually a success. Um, it was released on December 1st last year. So over nine months later, we still have over one million players playing the game each day. These kind of numbers that long after shipping a game, um, these are never seen numbers ever at Ubisoft. Um, there's a lot of things that we made to ship a 60 FPS game that were extremely important, but I will not cover them in my talk, but I, will, I want to at least mention them quickly. So I will not talk about our checkerboard rendering technique. You can see my friend Jalal GDC target interested, but basically we completely render only half the pixels in a frame uh, in the checkerboard pattern. Uh, we made optimizations in a bunch of different systems. A lot of people did that, but it's really specific to our game. Um, I won't cover task scheduling strategies. You know, in a 60 FPS game, not everything must be updated at 60 FPS. You could update some systems at 30, 20, 15, even 2 FPS. And I want to discuss completion flags, link time optimization, and this kind of thing that we use to make our game run as fast as possible. So I want to talk about performance and focus on things I think are interesting for any C++ programmer interested in performance, not only people in the gaming industry. So, so that we're on the same page, I will start by making an overview of our situation and also the workflow for performance on Windows 6. Then for my relocations, I will discuss how we both reduce our costs and their number. Then I will conclude with some large free solutions that we've used. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in my talk, so please keep questions for the end. So first, uh, our situation and workflow. Um, two years ago, I presented this picture of, of some fictional hardware made of six cores with three different layers of memory cache. The point was just, you know, as a core is accessing memory, it might need to go through different layers of memory cache, and the deeper it needs to go, the slower it gets, and basically you should design your software according to this reality. Uh, so with the permission of Microsoft and Sony, I can tell you today what's our reality for the current generation, so PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and it's not that far from that. So we have eight cores instead, and the cores are in clusters of four cores. Actually, the L2 cache is on the cluster. And since there's only two L2 cache, instead of having an L3 uh, cache, we have instead a bridge between the two L2 caches. But the bridge is slower. So conceptually, personally, as a software engineer, I see it as if we had actually an L3 cache. Uh, since we have clusters of four cores, it can make sense to assign specific jobs to a specific cluster. If, for example, the job is you know, accessing anatomic values, uh, it's better to compete for the exclusivity of the cache line and to end up with the speed of the L2 cache instead of the bridge, the speed of the bridge between the two L2 caches. So really specific stuff you might assign to a specific cluster. The last core don't have access to it, so the console is using it, um, perverting system, whatever you call it. Um, the seventh core is really interesting. On both consoles, we get partial access to it. So we get access to it for a certain percentage of the time, uh, which means it can be preempted very aggressively in the middle of something maybe not really cool while having, for example, the ownership of a mutex. So basically, all the code, the code that you run on the 7 core, it must be lock free. With the real definition of lock free, it must be possible at any moment without affecting the first six cores. Otherwise, we end with the priority inversion. So there's very, really specific systems that would run on this core. And the case of Rainbow Six, it forced me to introduce some large-free solutions. 
Um, so really specific stuff on the seven core, stuff for four to, on the first six cores, maybe on the first cluster, and of course we could have affinity on different cores. Then I want to mention very quickly our different targets, because I will mention them again in the talk. Uh, so then, well, first we have our debug build. I mentioned two years ago we use one level of lining and debug, so OB1 compiler flag with the Microsoft compiler. Um, the release build is what we release uh, on the production floor. This is not something we release on the public. So it's basically the same code. It still has a search and debug tools. It's just that the code is optimized. So when I say release target for the rest of the talk, this is kind of a debug build optimized. The profiling build has not that much utilities left. Uh, it just has the profiling utilities, but otherwise, it we try to have a performance as close as possible as the final build, which is what we deliver to the public. So of course we have even more target than these. We have a final build with link time optimization or a final build with more information in crashes, a release build with some projects de-optimized, but overall these are our four main targets. Uh, one of the core system that was used on Rainbow Six Siege on the production to make a 60 FPS game is a unified telemetry system. The concept is to have a single channel for all telemetry data coming from different systems. So this system will use timestamps that are universal, not only across them, but across different processes and machines as well. So we can log that telemetry data on the server or locally if needed. The point is that if uh, people are playing our game, um, want to be able to reproduce uh, we want to be able to fix performance issues without uh, having to reproduce the issue. So we want to have all the information for any drop of frame rate happening on the production inside Ubisoft without having to reproduce the issue. So suppose here, it's not playing that well. Uh, on, um, suppose uh, we have people playing the game. It's possible for a programmer to navigate to different sessions, to different players, and dig to see if there's been any frame rate uh, that doesn't look normal. And as we dig, here we, we, have a, we can see a destruction event. Uh, there's, there's some spikes in particle system. You dig more, you can see there's a CPU spike. And under it, we something blue, it's a screenshot, profiling screenshot made by the engine when it realized that the frame was longer than accepted. Um, and then you can click on this and it will open that screenshot. And what we see here, each row is a thread, uh, and we can see the different functions that have been called. And the one at the top is basically the task from our scheduling system. And under it, these are the functions that were called. Um, these are not actually exactly functions. They are, these are profiling tags that we define ourselves in our code. So we'll try to define the tags for something taking more time than, let's say, a microsecond. A microsecond is maybe a bit too short. Uh, the system support events as well, where just like punctual things happening. So if we look at the screenshots, uh, we don't see it that well, but there's a few circles at the bottom. These are events. We don't use that often. Um, otherwise, this is all the tags. And if we see two rows are, are two different threads. The system support printf style tags, but they are done offline in the tool because we want to minimize any performance effect in the engine. So in the end, we end up with a system with a pretty low CPU overhead and pretty low memory usage as well. This is really important because we keep a circular buffer all the time in the engine, even on consoles, to be able to dump these profiling screenshots at any time. It support context switches on all platforms, so basically if a core is preempted by the system or uh, waiting in a mutex, things like this. Uh, when there's a deadlock, we can ask the system dynamically in the engine for the two profiling tags that seem to be conflicting with each other. So basically, the one that's been running for the longest time. So that's why we can create a bug that is more specific to that deadlock instead of having a single bug with all deadlocks. And it supports low frequency counters to make graphs as well. So then when it comes to use all this information to improve performance, improving performance, I'm reading a lot to people so some, what some people uh, already said is that to me it's a lot about measurements. Even when you, are, you know what you're doing, you need to measure um, your performance improvements. I want to give an example. There's the string class in our engine is really simple. It's just a char pointer pointing to a buffer at, uh, in the heap. At the moment, we have no member with the size of the buffer, the size of the string. 
Um, and we had some performance issues on UI call. The, this type is not copy friendly and they were copying strings just too much. So I decided to try very quickly to add an atomic ref count of two bytes at the beginning of the buffer. Then I run the test and the result was the UI code was running now 15% faster, but the overall engine was 1.3% slower. I was able to reduce that 1.3% to something uh, pretty much zero by not using atomic calls when the string was not yet shared. So basically put a huge value, meaning ref count is one, but it's not yet shared. But still, if it's a 0% improvement overall, that didn't make sense to go with that change. So then uh, we'll optimize the UI code instead. To have myself, I did a subclass for a string class called in place string that will have an embedded buffer that will be used if the string is small enough. And string format, which is our version of SN printf, under the hood, it's using a circular, a thread local, circular buffers of buffers. And this is a technique we've been using for a long time in our engine to return char pointers by values. It's just that the caller needs to understand this is just valid for a certain amount of time. But then how you measure such a change? When you make a change and you want to know very quickly if it's a good change. So in our case, our source control is preferred. So we're right-click on a change list and we run a test, uh, we ask for a performance test. This will launch a tool that we call Performance Tester. And in the upper left corner, we can see the, the two setups that will be compared. Basically, by default, one is without any of your changes, while the other one is with the changes you just selected. And uh, the upper right corner, you will choose on which platform, which test, for how long. So typically, in my case, I will run the test for 10 hours bef on my PC be uh, before leaving at night. Then I will come back in the morning and have HTML report open, um, and I could see the results. Um, when the so thing here is that all the different individual test results are actually embedded in the HTML as JSON. The reason we do this is to be able to remove worst results or best results from the numbers that we're seeing. When we first did that, we thought maybe during the night, I don't know, Microsoft Outlook is doing crazy indexing and it will affect my tests. But then we realized that what we did care was actually the worst results. The reason is that on Rainbow Six Siege on the console, the game is running under the hood at an average of 70 FPS. So there's a 10 FPS buffer for things to happen, to our AV destruction things like this to happen. And when we have a frame rate drop under 60, it's typically because all the planets are in line in a way, for example, that the same mutex gets locked on every thread at the same time. So we do care about the worst results. Um, so actually, ideally, performance improvements will improve both the average and worst results, but we could afford if it will make the best results worse. Um, we even added later in a project and we embedded a graph inside the HTML. So with just sliders, we could very quickly remove mostly best results. So in the end, we're ending with the tool really easing, iterating on performance improvements, and also kind of prevented some bad or unworthy optimization to come in. Especially when we started to introduce some large free solutions, sometimes we just change the type of contention we have. And there's been situations where we're expecting a change to improve worse results, but degrade best results. But when we tested where our real application, it was the other way around. So it actually prevented some optimization to come in. That, you know, with normal tests, they will look like they were doing fine. So, so that's about our workflow for performance. Um, but a lot of our performance issues are with memory locations. So we address them by both reducing their cost and their number. So why do we care about memory locations? Um, this is a screenshot, a profiling screenshot uh, from Rainbow Six Siege uh, a few months before shipping. Um, what we see here, here um, all the light gray areas, they are all, uh, these are all context switches. So basically the CPU is in that case, is waiting on a mutex that if you look closely, it's inside an allocator. So we can see all the amount of wasted CPU we have. Uh, we cannot afford this. Uh, what we add an old generation setup, so Xbox 360, PlayStation 3. 
we're using a branch of the Assassin's Creed engine. And all the small sizes, they each have a dedicated allocator. Under up to 64, and over that, we have a few sizes with dedicated allocators as well. And we have a bunch of other allocators. The first one we tried was pretty much to replace everything by gem alloc, which has under the hood already these you know, pages for small allocations. Uh, but it was giving us worse results. So uh, it became obvious to us that we needed to iterate over our existing setup. Um, but back in the day, all these small sizes allocated, uh, we had only had 500 megs of RAM on previous generation. So we're using them for mostly two reasons, to reduce memory consumption, since you have no headers, you know, if you have an allocator with size eight, it's, you, know, it, it, you don't need any header. And also um, to remove fermentation, we don't want to have these small allocations inside more generic allocators. Um, but now we have 10 times more memory. It's less of an issue. What we want is CPU uh, power back. So we can sacrifice memory. So what we did is that we made all the fixed size allocators lock free, uh, even weight free, and we, we add a queue inside each of these allocators. Uh, when we delete, we pass a pointer. It needs to find the allocator, so there's a correspondence to make. Uh, so we made sure that all of this was lock free as well. And we also simplify a bunch of code layers when allocating memory. Uh, so again, the function choosing an allocator is typically in line. Uh, since often when allocate memory, you know, the size is known like compile time, often it's the size of the class or size of the class multiplied by constant. So we make sure that in all these cases, it's directly the allocator that appears, end up in the code. Um, two years ago, I mentioned that for arrays, arrays being our version of std vector, uh, if they are on the stack, we use a special allocator. Since, you know, it's very sad to have something on the stack using the heap since it's very temporary usage. Uh, and we kind of improve over that in the last two years. So what we do now, we have a thread local allocator and won't, we don't put that much memory in it. And it's basically like a second stack. So we just, but we don't unstack. We just move forward in that buffer. But at the end of a task, what is launched by our scheduler, we just reset that allocator. So in the release build, we'll you know, add additional information to count the number of, you know, um, the, our number of deletes in the allocator, to make sure that at the end when we reset, it's actually zero. But otherwise, in the final build, deleting is doing nothing. So under the hood, the array will look if the disk pointer is on the stack, and if it is, it will use that thread local allocator. Uh, to look if our pointers on the stack, we avoid system calls. Uh, they tend to cost too much. Uh, so what we do is that we just add a thread local variable that we just update uh, with the bottom of the stack, or very close to the bottom, let's say, uh, when we create a thread. And then later, we can compare with that thread local variable you nowhere know, from the stack. But we need also to compare with the top. Um, and the thing is, a lot of, most of our arrays are not on the stack, so we we'll even want to avoid accessing the, the thread local cache line for nothing. So the trick we do is that we look if we're one meg away from the top of the stack. And if not, we don't even bother looking at the, thread, the other thread local variable, well, the thread local variable. So we end up with something very cache friendly. We use the same cache lines over and over um, for different tasks. Very fast allocation is just one the thread local access and moving a pointer forward, and then no thread local access if the array is not on the stack. Freeze away nothing, there's no contention, it's all thread local. Um, so reducing the cost of allocation is nice. Removing them all together is even better. Um, and the first tool we have to address this is our telemetry system. So our telemetry system is supporting to log every memory location with our complete call stacks. Uh, it's a bit heavy, it's reducing maybe the frame rate by a third in our case. Um, but we have a 60 FPS game, so it's still playable. Um, so we'll make a game and then I could see all the allocations that will be you know, shown in the tree like this with the top of the stack first. So it's very easy to see which line of code is allocating too much and also which product is allocating too much since you know you tend to have a hook to for a product. 
One product uh, is internal, internal at Ubisoft. It's basically our internal flash player. Um, they were really responsive at reducing the number of locations. Uh, Rainbow Six Siege, they divide them, um, the, them by 100. So for a five-minute five game, they went from 300,000 allocations to 3,000. 3,000, this is one allocation per second. For a flash player responsible of all you are, you see in the game, I think that's pretty good. Need to go further, I think we need to get rid of flash. Um, so then, yeah, so then I used the tool to, you know, of course, fix a lot of issues all around the place. Um, but then it became obvious as we're closer to ship that I needed to sort these allocations by allocator. Because what I want to address are the allocations with the highest cost. It's not only about the, you know, it's the CPU and the so-called thread, it's about the contention they create. And I already said all the fixed size allocators, they are weight free, so the contention cost is a bit smaller. Um, so I need to address you know, the allocations in the most generic allocators and the one with the most. And I'll be honest, for some systems that were just doing too much allocations, I didn't have time to refactor them, so I just gave them an allocator um, to not mess with other allocators. And then there are the arrays. So again, array is like our STD vector-like class. And it's the same concept. When you add elements, you need to reserve before you, know, you push back elements. Otherwise, as you add elements, it will reallocate and reallocate and reallocate the buffer. If we even ignore the fact that it's copying things for nothing, you're also creating contention with other threads, with other cores, um, with no good reason. But how do you know the reserve size is up to date? I even see code sometimes doing this kind of the same code path twice, first time to know how many elements will be added and second time to add elements. But even when you do this, how do you know it's up to date? Two years ago, I mentioned uh, we used something called in place array with compile time size. Um, so basically, it will use the embedded buffer it has if it's small enough. Otherwise, it will still use a heap. But that size is compile time. And in a game like Rainbow Six Siege, the real life is a five versus five game. So it's even harder for programmer to know what is the usage of that array. So for example, if that X array, 99% of the time, it end up, it's ending up with less than nine elements, then this is a great line of code. But if 80% of the time it's actually bigger than eight, then this is probably slowing things down. So what I will want is statistics for all the array declarations in my entire code base. And I was thinking about it, and I said, uh, this is what I want that they have in C Sharp. Uh, when you can put an attribute um, on an argument, and the compiler will pass the file and the line number that is calling the current function, in that case, the array constructor. But I was not finding a way to use the processor easily to have the same behavior, but I did find something. And it's different on different platforms. On the Windows platforms, it is the return address function. So return address is returning the instruction calling the current function. So if you disable inlining, especially the array constructor, but you could disable inlining all over the place, um, this is giving something very close to an ID for the array declaration. So suppose I have a function with two arrays, it will be two different instructions calling the two different array constructors. In the case of a member, uh, it will be the instruction inside the class constructor. Then you might say if you have multiple constructors, then you end up with multiple IDs. Well, yes and no. When you analyze in your tool all the information, you will see these are constructors. And they will construct the array in the exact same order, the order of declaration inside the class. So you can merge all these IDs together. So under the hood, inside the array class, there's a array stat structure being into that for that specific feature. Um, and in the different array functions, we are just feeding the statistics. In the constructor, we call a macro, so to pass the return address, um, the name of the value type, and it's really nice that type ID actually works uh, for compile time stuff, even if we, in our case we disable our TTY. We added an enum for our subclasses of array, because in our case we have some, like in-place array, PTR array, so we pass also the name of the array type. 
And then later in the destructor, when all these stats have been filled, we just copy them to a buffer. And it's really simple. We just allocate one gigabyte, and we have an atomic index that we just move forward. So then uh, we can dump statistics, merge them in a compact format. And we can give a build to testers. They make a five versus five game. And they come back with 10 files, one for each player. And we open these files on our tool called the array analyzer. And what we see is exactly what we wanted. These are all the array declarations in the entire code base with all the statistics. Um, so an array here will be shown as this is the first array in that function, or the second array in that function, or the sixth array in that function. And you can see the type of the array. So just with these two information, it's already pretty obvious which array it is in the code. But even there, we even added support for double click to, to use PDB information and just open the corresponding line in Visual Studio. Um, but then you want to sort these arrays. And there's so many, you want to start with the worst offender, but there's so many ways to be an offender. So the first thing we did is to add a combo box at the top with different situations that will result in different ways to sort the arrays. So for example, the first one, easy reserve fix. Reserve count is always more than one. Second one, big reserve, not enough. If you need to initial big size, the array was size even bigger. The third one, no brainer in place. The array is always on stack and the reserve size is always small. So we should just use the in place array class I've shown earlier. And we even count in some array functions that are doing linear searches. Then after enough time you're doing them, so then we can if there's a high number of elements in the array, we can tell maybe here you should consider using a different container. Suppose I take an example. Uh, this one doesn't have that much statistics, so it's easier to show. Uh, this is a third array inside a function. So it will highlight in red the statistics that seems to be wrong, and in green what you should look at to fix it. So here, the reserve count was 232 times. So this be 32 instances of that array. And in the destructor, when we register the statistics, it has always been reserved twice. The limit count is not always the same thing. We can see the distribution. So it was five, four times, seven, 19 times, and eight, nine times. So this is the number of elements in uh, the moment we register statistics in the destructor. The peak buffer size, we can see it has been eight, four times, 10, 20 times. And the first reserve size, here we can see not a constant in the code. It was four, four times, and six, 28 times. So obviously the code is trying to take you know, a proper decision, but obviously it's not. Uh, the first time I saw this increase four to eight and six to 10, I was a bit surprised. I thought we're increasing our average size with a factor. Then I look in the code and actually within Thunder 16, we just had four. Um, so of course, when we first ran the tool, we're finding much worse cases than this one. You know, cases where no reserve at all and a lot of allocations. Um, but these allocations, will, you might still find them with the telemetry system I've shown, or normal profiling, at a higher cost, but I think we'll find them. What I like about this one is that I think you will not fix it at all without that tool. Um, and you're still dividing by two the number of allocations and potential contention you're creating with other cores. So we ending up with a tool where we're optimizing arrays all over the place, and the changes could be made by a much more junior programmer. So the cost of fixing all these usage of arrays was much lower than before. I quickly want to mention an issue with std function. Um, you know, std function typically it has a small object buffer optimization in it, and will make a placement new if the, the functor you assign is um, small enough. But then you know your code evolves, and suddenly it's no more using the, the object buffer. It's now it's not using the heap. Uh, so imagine I'm running that each, fr uh, each frame. I already told you our Flash player is doing one allocation per second. There's no way I'll accept that this line is doing 60 more times allocations. Uh, so I discussed the issue with, on the study group uh, 14, uh, dedicated to low latency. And basically, everybody had redone their own implementation of std function to avoid the issue. Uh, so I'm a co-author of a proposal with Carl Cook, and it moved forward uh, at the meeting. Um, today. Um, so we propose to add in the standard library uh, in place function um, that's as the exact same interface except it will never use the heap. 
So if you assign something too big, it will not compile. You will get a static assert. And then you can, you have an additional template argument that you can use to ask for a bigger buffer. So, uh, well, obviously we missed the C17 deadline. So if you're interested, don't feel free to grab our example implementation. We basically took the good ideas of a lot of people and put them all together. Um, and now I want to conclude the talk with some large free solutions. I always said the seven core forced us to put large free solutions, but they ended up being useful um, uh, much more than just the seven core. Um, but before I want to present a tool that is very similar to the IRA analyzer tool I've shown. It's our tool called the lock analyzer. Uh, getting an, an ID for an IRA was a bit tricky. Um, but for mutex, I think it's much more simpler. In our case, mutexes, they tend to be inside managers, uh, which are uh, singletons. Uh, sometimes the mutex is static, global. Um, it's very rare we put them in objects. And even if you do, that, that object will live for an entire frame. Uh, and when we lock them, which means that the pointer is you know, already a good enough ID. And when we lock them, we often use a macro like this one. So in that macro, we have access to the name of the mutex and also the file that is locking the mutex. So we all add, if we add all these informations uh, inside the profiling files, we can then parse them on the network for different sessions. And in our tool called the lock analyzer, you can deduce all the different locks in the entire code base. Uh, so for each one, uh, we can see, you know, I mean, how much time we're wasting waiting on them. Suppose I take an example here. This is our endl manager lock. And it's showing a call stack. This is a profiling tag call stack. And we can see at the right, it has been locked uh, for almost one millisecond in a frame at some point. Um, when I'm clicking on this, actually, that's somewhere else in the tool, I'm seeing all the worst situations, uh, with the first one being the very worst one. And there's an hyperlink for each in our the case the tool is called your studio and it will zoom to the region where uh, the stuff happened. So I click on it and I can see what happened. So again, all the library areas are all context switches. And here we can see three threads fighting for uh, the same mutex inside our endl manager. So our endl manager is based on object IDs and at the moment it's not, let's say, 100% lock free. Um, but actually, I added on the project a lock free and all reference system. So it's basically like um, atomic um, share pointer and weak pointer, but with a bit more intrusive and the scopes being entire frames. So here the solution is to just use that large free and all system instead. It's based on pointers and not object IDs. And it works because in that case, the shape is actually created on runtime. We don't need the burden of object IDs. And this large free uh, end all and reference system was is actually based under the hood by with two simple large free containers that we use, and I want to quickly present them. Uh, from now on, I'm showing a bit more code on my slides. So don't read the code too much. We focus on what is highlighted in red. Also, the code is really there for reference for later. Um, also, I'm, I will use a default uh, memory order for the atomics, uh, just for simplicity. So our first container is the lock-free queue, and it's a good example of how we like a lock-free code. It's really simple. It's just three atomics variable, and we also define the maximum thread count. So basically the concept is if there's only that left in the space in the buffer, we just consider the queue full. That way we can simplify the code even more. So we put elements in the queue, the code is really straightforward, we just modify two atomic values, and if the queue is full, we just crash. When we remove from the queue, really straightforward again, we just modify two atomic values. What I want to point out is that I don't think you should modify an atomic values inside a loop, uh, since you could create you know, contention with other cores over and over. Um, but this is a common use case with a queue um, to want a lot of thread feeding the queue in a single one consuming everything. So to do this, well, we added this very simple object we just declare on the stack the constructor is loading the atomic values and the destructor is consuming them. So we add um, support for frame inch loops uh, for convenience. 
And then there's our lock free pool. Uh, typically, uh, non lock free pool will use the same memory space for the node and the objects. So basically, the pool will point to the first free node, will point to the next one, and so on. So the node will be as big as the type of objects you want in your pool. And what I've seen is typically people, when they want a lock free pool, instead they have a buffer for the objects and they combine that with a lock free queue. But I wanted to avoid the memory overhead of a queue. My idea at first was to add in the pool not only the index for the first three node, but also the next, next three node. The idea was to just put these two things in the same 64 bits and update them at once. Make some tests and actually, uh, that wasn't exactly working, still had an ABA problem. It was possible for threads to come back to the exact same values. And the solution is much more classical and simpler actually, is to use a version counter. So if you don't know about a version counter, the concept is to have a part of the atomic value variable that is updated each time you update it. So the only way to create a bug is, is that value is looping around, but with 32 bits, you will need thread to sleep while all the other threads are doing four billion-ish changes and are coming back to the exact same 64-bit value. I think we're safe. So then the code is pretty straightforward. This is very normal Q code, uh, pool Q, uh, pool code, sorry. Um, so suppose you want to take the first node and give it back as an object. You just want the pool to point to what is the next free node after that and return the node as an object. So then the code is pretty straightforward. You just copy the 64 bits, you work, and then you make your campaign change. If there's been no campaign change between these two lines of code, then it will pass. Otherwise, you retry your concurrent swap loop. Things to mention here, uh, this is where the data policy inside the pool can decide to grow it if it's supported. And also, we increase the version counter before updating, doing the campaign change. When we want to give an, back an object to the pool, uh, we want the, the, the pool to point to that, that node that was the object before, and it will point to what was before the first free node. So again, it's straightforward. You copy the 64 bits, then it work, and you make your campaign change, we will pass, we will succeed, and if there's been no campaign change between these two lines of code that are in red. Things to note in here, the virtual encounter being incremented, but also, uh, you want to update the index inside a node before committing the node to the pool. So is it worth it to have that lock free pool compare with a lock free queue and an object buffer? Well, the lock free queue is actually, can actually be weight free. I've shown an example where it's weight free. So it could behave better with maybe a lot of cores, a lot of contention, but it has a memory over it. And there's a consequence to that, is that the lock free pool is actually accessing one less cache line for both operations. Uh, so in a real life scenario, in the case of a game like Rainbow Six Siege, uh, if that cache line is cold, then the lock free pool would perform better. Even if the cache line is hot, it's still removing, you know, the cache line for something, something else that could be hot. Uh, so you really need to test your real application. So basically, if you don't have that much contention, I think the lock free pool is an interesting solution. If you have a bit more, then yeah, okay, you have, maybe you want to use a weight, weight free queue combined with a buffer. But if you have even more, I just want to point out that I think you want something thread local combined with whatever. Maybe it's a thread local queue that is using, in worst cases, a global queue, and then you need to decide when you update these thread local queues. So for example, a profiling system, it's all waking, working with thread local data. We don't want a profiling system to add contention. It's there to measure all of this. So my point here is that way free, you know, with atomics, it's not free. If a lot of cores are accessing the same atomic value, you will end up with the, the speed of the cache that is a little slower. So that can be the L3 cache on a PC or the bridge between the two L3 caches I've shown on consoles. I want to open a small parenthesis. Two years ago, I've shown an allocator that we use to debug memory corruptions. The concept is then when we locate an object, we'll put it at the end of a page and make the next page read only. So if you write past the object, you will crash in the guilty code. 
And when we free that object, we may keep the page, the, this page read-only uh, for some time uh, with a queue. And we kind of improve over that. Now we use uncommitted pages, uh, and they are committed forever. So it's, the memory addresses are just invalid, so you cannot even read. It's even better. And when we free the object, we just uncommit the page forever. We don't need a queue. So the code is very straightforward. It's just very heavy on paging file size. But otherwise, we can play our entire game with this. Uh, and someone asked me two years ago why I was not using PageHeap from Microsoft. And, but to be honest, we didn't know about PageHeap. But we do appreciate to have an allocator in code that can you know, trigger for specific allocations. And I want to give an example. We had a crash in March on Rainbow Six Siege uh, only in the final bill. The reason it was only in the final bill is a bit funny. Uh, when we switch to 64 bits, we use a trick from Bruce Dawson to reserve the first four gig of memory addresses. But from the beginning, it was if def to not be in the final bill. And we completely forget to remove it later. Um, the consequence is that all the pointers in the non-final bills, they were always starting with one, but not in the final bill. And the memory card option was a one getting written in a word only used by pointers. Uh, so we're in a bit of a panic, and we had crashes with you know, real players around the world. Um, and my friend GP said, you know, it's almost always crashing in a sound class. But nothing's changed in sound recently. So I asked him, what is the size of that class? And he said 72. And I already told you, and I size 72 as its allocator. So I told him, replace that allocator by the page project allocator. And we found the bug right away. It had nothing to do with sounds. It was a third party that was expecting an object to live a bit longer. And that object was created a single time, so it would have been a real pain to find without this. So why am I telling all of this? Um, this concept is really useful for the pool. If someone is writing inside an object that was in the pool by mistake, uh, after it has been deleted, um, then it might corrupt the next the index of the next node. Then I will end up debugging the pool, thinking I have a log-free bug. <laughs> I don't want that. Uh, so what I did is that I added a policy that will allocate complete pages for elements that can trigger manually like this in the code. So the pages will be put at read-only when, you know, when the node is free, and when it's not, then <laughs> we change that. What I would do actually is that in the release bill, I will write special values in all the bytes of the node. And when I'm giving back the node as an object, I will validate all these bytes. The next index, I could store it, store it elsewhere to validate it as well. And if any of these bytes is, you know, the validation, validation is finding, uh, I will tell the programmer, assert and tell the programmer, use that policy and you will find the bug you currently have. That policy is not only used for that. It's actually, in our profile, in our final build, our pool doesn't grow. So we pass the size and that's it. If it's bigger than that, it will just crash. Uh, but on the production floor, eh, maybe not that cool. So we support to have 10 times more elements. We just log in our database the call stack when we first reach that size. Um, yeah, so quick recap so you can think about your questions. So, Gave an overview of two initial uh, in the workflow, seven core for clusters, telemetry, perf tester. Uh, I'll reduce memory location, or the cost and number. Uh, so some log free locators, task locator, telemetry, arenizer, in place function, and some log free solutions as well. So I think we have now time for some questions. Before taking questions, I want to thank some people. I made a talk inside Ubisoft. Uh, with Sébastien Lucier and Mauricio de Pascali, uh, and I even took some other slides. Um, Sébastien worked on the low-level memory optimization, and with Pascal Dralet on the profiler implementation. And Mauricio de Pascali work, was the architect behind the unified telemetry system. And I want to thank also Jean-René Méville, which, which pretty much made um, all the analysis tools I've shown. So thank you. Uh, we, I guess we have time now for some, some questions.
Yes. Our own uh, template uh, with uh, type, uh, our own way allocate template with a type E, not with a size. How do you instantiate your uh, allocate template? Just how do we, your question is, how do we allocate? Okay, I don't quite understand the questions. Uh, you're asking, are we instantiate? You seem to ask about allocators for specific types, which we don't have this. Are they time-based allocator template parameters or type-based template parameters? Okay, so um, the question is about our fixes allocators. Are there, uh, I don't even know if there's this a template argument for the size itself. Uh, it's actually the, the, the function choosing the algorithm is just very basic code with switch cases and if else. And then we have different instances that are different allocators for different sizes. And, and the code itself, I don't even know if it's a constructor argument or, uh, or compile time. Maybe we can, I can <coughs> Okay, cool. Okay, so the question is if our performance tester is running tests locally or uh, distributed. Uh, we don't support distributed yet. We support running on a PlayStation 4 and Xbox One or PC. Um, the next step will be to support distributed. Um, yeah, but it was good enough to run it for the entire night, so kind of live with that. All these tools were developed, you know, in the last four months of the project, I will say, maybe six months. So, um, yeah, so we didn't go with distributed, but sometimes I'm fantasming about having all of this. Uh, do we have the possibility to push for profiling build to players that have issues? Uh, the answer is no at the moment. Uh, we're discussing be able to triggering some stuff uh, in the final build, uh, we know, for example, we look at the code of um, Google Chrome and they have a feature to get call stacks, uh, their, own, um, their own feature to get call stacks you know, in the process. Uh, and we were discussing recently if we should do something like this, but we definitely cannot deliver a profiling build like it is because there's strings all over the place. Um, so uh, at the moment, there's, there's no way we'll use that, but we could maybe in the future have something. Yes? Uh, okay, so if we're working on Windows, if you look at using different tools on the Windows platform to profile, right? Um, we, we do as, as well. Uh, we tend to work a lot with the profiling screenshots I've shown since they work on all platforms and it's often you know, which task is doing too much. Uh, so the more classical profiling with tools like VTunes and all these kind of tools, we use that much less. But of course some programmers are doing it as well. Um, and we use of course consoles tools. Sometimes the tool on console is also really great since they really care about you know, uh, you optimizing for their platform. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's very organic. We use a lot, bunch of different tools. Any more questions? Oh, yeah. So is the input for the analyzer tool coming from the telemetry? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, yeah, well, actually, it's, right now it's funny, it's actually in XML. We were at first dumping in XML and by merging you know, all the, the distribution, you know, um, it was small enough, so we didn't even bother putting it in binary. So um, yeah, so yeah, at the moment it's just a file we dump and that's it. So it's not going to telemetry. But anyway, we, give a, we could do it in telemetry, but you know, since it's very special occasion, we make, if that, we make a special build, we give it to testers, so we, we can just grab them the file from different testers, so no, we're not.
going through a telemetry system. Any more questions? Well, thank you for coming. Thank you.